Welcome to your very own Survivor's Guide to Hell. We're your host, PJ and Jerry Aubrey. We know how hard it is to find good news these days. It comes at a price, too. Studies show that bad news can amp up your stress hormones, increase your depression, and cause you to be less kind to the people around you. In some cases, it even increases rates of crime and suicide in your community. At Survivor's Guide to Hell, we want to help you breathe easier. Each week, we select a difficult topic and use that topic to help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even change your perspective for the better. Today, our unpleasant topic is... Not having the right words to say. Not having the words to say. It gets the best of us. Missing the words you're looking for is an incredibly versatile nuisance. It can be something as petty as kicking yourself for not thinking of that zingy line until after the conversation has ended. Or it can be as devastating as missing the chance to say what was in your heart before a loved one passed away. I experienced something in the middle of that spectrum the other day. I had just concluded a shopping trip at Walmart and had finished loading my kids in the van. As I dug my heels into the parking lot and slid the last door closed, I heard a very troubled, very sloppy, excuse me, from behind. When I turned, I saw a woman standing near my taillight. If her voice sounded troubled, her expression looked nearly tortured. The woman looked on the border of middle-aged and elderly with a vulnerability to her posture and a submission in her voice. She asked me if I spoke Spanish, and since she asked in Spanish, the odds of us having a functional English conversation looked pretty slim. I replied in her native tongue. I speak a little Spanish. Yo hablo un poco español. She burst like a dam of words, rapidly explaining that she lived nearby and was having trouble paying for gas to get to work and food to put on the table. At least that's what I think she said. I was not kidding when I told her I spoke a little Spanish. She spoke so quickly I felt nearly frozen with intimidation. One moment, please, I managed to scrape up the Spanish to say. I opened the driver door, fetched my wallet, and pulled out five dollars. My sweet daughter in the passenger seat handed me a few small bills from her own wallet, and I handed them all to the woman. Is there anything else I can help you with? I asked, still in Spanish. I'm really in need of food, she said. By this point, her voice was quavering, and her eyes looked at me through a window of tears. I went to my trunk, which had been freshly loaded with the week's groceries. I reached inside, then handed her a box of cup noodles. Gracias, gracias, she said tearfully. Dios te bendiga, Dios te bendiga. I replied with buena suerte or good luck, and she continued with her Spanish God bless you until she literally walked out of earshot. I got into the van, turned the ignition, and proceeded to chew myself out all the way back home. Not because I'd just given away the only box of my husband's go-to snack, but because I'd only applied a band-aid to whatever gaping wound was causing that woman to struggle for food and gas. Why didn't I tell her about the food bank or ask if she needed help getting there? My grammar would probably be horrible. Horrible. But I still knew enough Spanish to get the point across. I may have helped set her up with a continuous flow of food instead of a finite box of ramen noodles. Instead, I let myself get intimidated and tongue-tied. My failure ate me alive for the rest of the day, and for the first time in months, I opened up my Spanish practice app when I got home. In today's podcast, we have two different acts that could give you something to think about the next time you can't find the right words. The first act is for you listeners who have ever wanted to communicate something for which the right words didn't even exist. For the second act of today's episode, we searched for tales of times where people were in dire need for the right words to share, and what happened next. Get your dictionaries and thesauruses, everyone! Let's get tongue-tied. Act 1. 18 incredibly useful words with no English translation. You may 
have heard the popular myth that Eskimo language, aka Inuit, Yupik, and related dialects, has over 100 words for snow. Though that number is exaggerated, the actual count of Eskimo snow words is still quite impressive. According to linguists, there are roughly 50 words specifically used for describing snow. This may sound staggering for those of us that can only think of the words sleet and, well, snow to describe those frosty flakes from the sky. The plentiful words of Eskimo speech are the most popular example of a wide snow vocabulary. But did you know that, depending on which wordsmith you ask, us Americans have nearly 40 words? Blizzard is another piece of vocab us Yanks use specifically to describe snow. We also have sestrugi, which are the irregular grooves you see in snow that has been subject to windy conditions. Then there's polycrystal, which is the word for several snowflakes that have fused together. There's fern, F-I-R-N, which is snow that is over a year old, and sun cups, which are shallow hollows made in snow from irregular patches of sunlight. Here's two to remember the next time you're driving in snowy conditions. Pillow drift, which is a large snow drift blown across a roadway, and snurt, snow mixed with dirt. Full disclosure, I could only find this definition of snurt in less formal dictionaries. When I looked up snurt in Merriam-Webster, it described an unsuccessfully suppressed snort of laughter, which I find just as pleasing as snow mixed with dirt. You want to know who actually takes the cake for most words that describe snow? Drum roll, it's the Scots. According to the University of Glasgow, Scots have 421 words for snow. The language blog shares a few favorites. Fiefel, which is snow drifting around a corner. Skelf, which is a large snowflake. And Snawbrew, which is melted snow. It took me a moment to accept that there was a small difference between Snawbrew and water, but I got there. The point is, though we may often find ourselves at a loss for words, there's a lot of unused vocabulary out there. We're going to share a few of our all-time favorite words today that come from all around the world. If you've ever struggled to find the words to say, you may appreciate these linguistic bonbons for their ability to cut right to the center of the unspoken feelings you're dealing with. And if you're like me, you'll feel a greater sense of kinship with the other humans on this globe. If they needed a word for that too, then you already have something intimate in common with them. Let's begin. A little side note on some of the pronunciations that you're going to hear in the next section. We did our very best to find pronunciations from native speakers. Some of them don't have the best audio quality, but they should be authentic. There was one word that we couldn't find a satisfactory pronunciation of, but we did find from linguists that besides our North American accents, we were pronouncing it the way it was meant to be said. All right, here we go. Word number one, milita mpash, mpash, which is Bantu for the lingering bliss left by a beautiful dream after you've woken up. Sounds like the opposite of a nightmare, kind of. The opposite of waking up from a nightmare. Yeah. That's nice. All right, your go. Okay, the second word is, wow, ver. Schlimm bessern. Verschlimm bessern. Verschlimm bessern. <laughs> Which means to make something worse by trying to improve it. Sounds exactly what they did with this word. <laughs> yeah, that one's German, by the way. Um, word number three. Gokota? Ja, Uta. That's Swedish? It means to wake up early in the morning with the purpose of going on a walk to hear the first birds sing. And if that is so prominent in Sweden that they actually need a word for it, doesn't it really make you want to move to Sweden? That's just amazing. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, word number four looks to me like Jayus. Good guess. Uh, which is Indonesian. Jayus. It's a joke that is so poor or told so badly that it's actually funny. Um, sounds like a lot of your humor. <laughs> <laughs> You're we Jace. Should, <laughs> Your mom's know, Jace. We should know that word. <laughs> yeah, we should know all of these. Okay, number five. I did take one semester of French in high school. 
This is a French word. Are you ready? L'esprit de l'escalier. I still don't know if I said it right. L'esprit de l'escalier. It's, oh, it's one of my favorites on the list. The predicament of thinking of the perfect reply too late. Why don't we have a word for that in English? Yeah. It is so good. Why didn't we include that in the previous uh, thing we just recorded? Shh, it's in the next one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so moving on to number six, which is Japanese, which would be koi no yokan. Koi no yokan. The premonition of love, i.e., meeting someone you feel you will fall in love with. Number seven is it's either gigil or jigil or jigil, I don't know. It's Filipino. Gigil. And it's when something is so cute you have the urge to squeeze it. <sighs> I could mix two of these words together and make a new name for you. <laughs> What are they? <laughs> Do I want to know? Um. Is it Jayus? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. That would be you. I'm a giggle Jayus. Jayus giggle. <laughs> Great. I'm really not funny, but at least I'm super cute. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so the next one is Danish and Norwegian, and it's Heig? Heigig? <laughs> Huga. That is a weird word. Okay, it is a mood of coziness and comfortable... Conviviality. Conviviality. <laughs> There's another word we could have put on the list. With feelings of wellness and contentment. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it sound cozy? A Doesn't it? A mood of coziness and comfortable conviviality. Okay, number nine. This is another favorite of mine. It's pena ajena. Pena ajena. And that's Spanish for vicariously feeling someone else's embarrassment. I think that happens a lot on the videos I watch on YouTube. I think that's why they're so popular. It's, I, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <sighs> okay, so number 10 looks like Tartle. Tartle. Which is from the Scots. Tartle, Tartle. Tartle. <laughs> that's the embarrassing hesitation while trying to recall someone's name. I tartle all the time. You do tartle all the time. <laughs> you live in the tartle. <laughs> yes, I'm a tartle. Tartler. You're a tartler. <laughs> You're a tartler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number 11. I think it's Tingo. I don't even know how to pronounce that, the language that that's spoken in. Rapa Nui? Rapa Nui. Tingo. Which is to gradually acquire all the possessions of a neighbor by borrowing and not returning. That's just theft. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's, yeah. No, it's a much cuter form of theft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got a good neighbor involved. <laughs> yeah. No, officer, I'm just Rapa Nui. <laughs> <laughs> just Rapa Nui. All right. Okay. Um, number 12, Wabi Sabi. Wabi Sabi. Which is Japanese. Finding beauty in imperfection. Yeah. I think that's just so graceful. Sounds a lot like wasabi, which is just perfection. Must be what that means in Japanese. Maybe. Okay. Number 13, Luftmensch. 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 That's Yiddish. It refers to someone who is a bit of a dreamer, literally an, quote, air person. Okay, <laughs> moving on to number 14. We got Mokaita. Mokita. Which is from Kavila. I hope I said that right. It is the truth everyone knows, but agrees not to talk about. I think we call that the elephant in the room. Yeah. In English? I think so. But they have, yeah. a, they have a word. I think they, they have need a word. word. Yeah. Mokaida. All right. Number 15. This will probably be the most butchered word on our list. It's Dabjangnil. <laughs> Dabjangnil. That's Korean. Dabjangnil. <laughs> When somebody has already decided the answer they want to hear after asking a question and are waiting for you to say the exact answer. That happens a lot. I think that goes in the same emotional intelligence category as the Mokita one. Mm -hmm. The truth everyone knows but agrees not to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would like an elephant named Mokita. We should <laughs> suggest that at the zoo. Okay, number 16. <laughs> Number 16, which is Tretar. Tretur. 
um, which is Swedish, and it's a second refill or a three fill of coffee. A three fill? I would like to see that on the menu at the local coffee shop. I would yeah. like a tray tart, please. Like a tray tart. <laughs> so good, you need three. I'm really amped up. Yeah. <laughs> tray tart. I love it. Okay, number 17. Oh, that's another hard one. Waldein Samkeit. Waldein Samkeit. Waldein Samkeit. That's German, which is the feeling of solitude, being alone in the woods, a connectedness to nature. Walden Samkeit. Wow. That's a good one. All right, last one. You're up. Number 18. Kafun? I think it's Kafune. Oh, Kafune. Kafune. Which is Brazilian Portuguese. The act of tenderly running one's fingers through someone's hair. You love that. I love Kafune. Love Kafune. <laughs> Kafune. <laughs> you make it sound like macaroni. Oh. Okay. We'd like to thank Bond Traveler, Syntacta, and Thought Catalog, who were our primary sources for the information in this act of today's podcast. It's our hope that one of these words has helped give you a voice to something you've felt, seen, or done. Hopefully you haven't stolen all your neighbor's stuff by never giving it back. But anyway. Here's a Survivor's Guide to Hell fun fact. Our data shows that we've had listeners from the Netherlands, Australia, the UK, Kenya, Greece, and France. A shout out to you guys. We think it's amazing you're tuning in. And if you know any words we should have shared, please let us know. Hello, my awesome listener. You may have heard us talk about Operation Positivity Poddemic, which is our goal to more than double our audience by December 31st, 2022. What do you say? Join our operation. One simple way is to follow us on Facebook. It's a win-win. You will get convenient access to exclusive updates and content. And it'll be easier for new listeners to discover us and enjoy our dose of silver linings. Just type A Survivor's Guide to Hell in that Facebook search bar and click follow. You can also find me, PJ Aubrey, on Twitter. Act 2. What to say when you'll never get another chance. You probably know that sometimes failing to express yourself is not always an issue of vocabulary. Sometimes, like the French described with le spirit de escalade, I, mean, I, I totally killed that one. The real issue is timing. Maybe you fumbled through an argument, only able to properly articulate your position after the damage had already been done. Maybe you wanted to break the ice with a beautiful stranger, but couldn't untie your tongue until the stranger was already gone. Maybe someone had confronted you with an accusation, but you could only find the words to exonerate yourself after the consequences had already been doled. One of the most common examples of this predicament in media, especially fiction, is when a loved one dies, leaving behind the person who wished they'd said, I'm sorry, or I love you, or any number of soulful expressions. I've wondered about this. How often does this deathbed debacle happen in real life? We've curated a few stories for Act 2 of today's episode, each describing the final words that were or weren't shared before a loved one's passing. Each one has its own kind of silver lining, whether it's a meaningful accomplishment, a life-changing lesson, or a sweet memory. And who knows, if you're having a hard time finding the words to say, perhaps these stories will help you find the words that matter most. Note, some of these stories have been altered slightly to improve clarity, grammar, and length. The message and plots, however, have been preserved, and they come from the core question. What are the things you wish you'd said to someone before they died, but didn't? You can find the full thread via hyperlink on the blog post that corresponds with this episode. That's at our website, www.survivorsguidetohell. Okay, this one's from Katherine Burke, who is an author. She says, My longtime writing coach died nine months before my books were published. She would have been so happy to have known that all our time paid off. I would have loved to have told her in person and seen her light up. This next one is from Diana Weissend, an optician. I didn't know that the last time I saw my sister would be the last time. Tammy was diagnosed with scleroderma a disease also known as stone disease. It is caused by overproduction of collagen in the body, 
It causes literal hardening of the skin, especially the lips, hands, and fingers. It eventually moves to the internal organs, like the heart and lungs. There is no known cure. My sister was a fighter. She participated in every experimental treatment available to her. In the early stages of her diagnosis, she was treated in various specialty clinics with different medications, etc. In spite of everything, she lived a fairly normal life. She continued in her job as a Blue Cross Blue Shield representative and had a second job at her friend's pub as a cook. My husband and I lived in Tennessee, and Tammy lived in our home state of Michigan. I would see her when we came up for various family functions, and when she started to get more ill, I would fly there to be with her whenever I could. There would be episodes where she would have to be hospitalized, but she always pulled through. On March of 2008, I took two weeks off from work and flew up for another visit. I spent many days, nights, and hours at her bedside, believing she would pull through yet again. I spent the evening with her in her hospital room the day before my return flight, and we talked about many things. She was lucid and in good spirits, being her normal, hilarious self. She was the funniest girl I've ever known. Eventually, it was repeatedly brought to my attention by various nurses that we were well past visiting hours. Tammy and I said goodbye with smiles, laughter, and our usual parting words, See you next time. I love you. As I walked out, I looked back at her. She was crying. She knew, but I didn't. I wouldn't let myself know. My sister died at age 46 on March 19th, 2008, three days after I flew back to Tennessee. What do I wish I could have told her before she died? Nothing. I had already told her. See you next time. I love you. Our next story is from Barbara Hinther, a writer. I am making a bum out of Barbara, was the last thing my grandma said to me and my family before she died. I had taken time off to be with her, and she was worried I would lose my job. I was choked up. She was worried about my income and career. I wish I had told her that I can always find another job, but never another wonderful grandma. I folded... I cried, words wouldn't come, just tears. I remember and continue to miss her for over 30 years. I hope I am half the grandparent she was. Okay, another one from Ella H., who is a master gardener and self-proclaimed hippie. She says, I had the good fortune to be with my mom as she died. I held her hand and told her that I loved her and that she was the best mom ever born. She answered, see the birds? The birds! And passed away. I saw my dad the day before he died, and we had a good conversation about the days he barnstormed around the US working for gas money for his plane during the depression. My dad was an exceptional storyteller. The night my husband died, I cuddled in bed with him, tried to talk him into going to the ER, bathed his hands and face in cool water, got him some 7-Up, and took care of the intimate needs a man appreciates from his wife. I think he died as happy as he could be. He had seen his newborn granddaughter that day and told everyone how happy he was to be a grandpa again. Anything I could have said to my ex-husband before his death would have been unnecessary. We'd said it all already. I even got to hold my dog in my arms when she died last month. She knew she was loved. I'm pretty lucky, really. I got to say goodbye to most of the people who were important in my life. I hope my family gets to do the same with me. Here's one from Kathy Naomi, who is a Sao Paulo State University graduate. I know that it sounds cliche, but I wish I would have told my special ones how much I loved them and how much they meant to me. I used to write a lot of letters for my family and friends. I moved outside my country when I was in my early 20s, and I was very busy with my studies. I ended up postponing a letter that my grandma had been waiting on for a long time. When I finally replied, the letter took so long to get to my country that she passed away before she could read how much I loved her. 
The same thing happened with my mother-in-law. She used to live by herself, and I'm pretty sure that she felt lonely sometimes. I didn't send her a letter for six months because I wanted to wait until I had a good job and could write to her with the special news. When I finally got that job, I wrote a letter and said how much I was thankful for everything she did for me and for my husband. I told her how important she was to me. This letter, however, was also only delivered after she passed away. I never thought she would die so quickly because she was still so young. After these events, I started to say, I love you, I'm thankful for everything you did for me, and you're very important to me, without waiting for a special day or until I find time for that. No more regrets for being too late. Here's our final story, brief but golden, from Corinne Florin, who is a University Archives and Special Collections librarian. She says... I was lucky to have been able to say goodbye to my husband and tell him that I love him before he died. I know he left us peacefully. At a talk I had attended one month earlier, the speaker told us there are four things to say to a dying loved one. I forgive you. Don't qualify it or explain it. It says it all right there. Please forgive me. Same as above. Don't qualify it. I love you. I'll miss you. As I held my husband's hand when he died, I said those things and I'm glad I did. He died three months short of our 46th wedding anniversary, and I miss him terribly. That's nearly it for today's episode, but I've got a couple more silver linings for you. Remember my story of regret over not being more helpful to the Latino woman in the parking lot? Well, now I'm prepared to do things the right way in English or Spanish. In fact, I recently saw an ad on a public classifieds website from a woman seeking food, and I was able to tell her exactly what I wish I'd said to the woman at Walmart. That's the good thing about being tongue-tied. It usually causes you to be more deliberate, thoughtful, and prepared than a version of you that didn't have to struggle for words the first time around. It's part of the process we all go through to refine ourselves as we navigate our unpredictable lives. That's not to say there's nothing you can do to be prepared the first time around. To conclude our production, we'd like to share a few brief tips to help you out of your verbal sticky spots. The first tip comes from Sarah Hurwitz, former speechwriter for Michelle Obama. Her entire job was to help people have the right words to say. Her advice? Ask yourself, what is the deepest and most important truth that I can tell at this moment? Another tip, stay respectful. Even if your intentions are good, your argument is correct, you are the supreme guardian of truth, whatever, you will seem like the bad guy if you forget to be kind and courteous. People usually don't want to consider what the bad guy has to say, and you'll likely turn off the reasoning portion of people's brains in favor of the self-defense portion, if you forget to be kind. Third tip. If the situation allows, be honest about your difficulty finding words. Something like, I'm having a hard time expressing what I really mean. Can we revisit this after I give it some thought? Maybe the best thing to say when you don't know what to say. You'll almost certainly return with a better, more thoughtful response than whatever reply might have waterfalled out of your mouth under pressure. Last tip. Like Corrine Florin shared at the end of Act 2, maybe the most important words you could say are, I forgive you. Please forgive me. I love you. That is the end of today's episode. Now we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, actionable step you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. This is a survivor's guide after all. Here it is, the Silver Liners Challenge. You've got two options this week. The first, learn a new word and use it. The second, remind someone you love them really remind them. Feel free to share your experiences in the comments of our website, survivorsguidetohell.com, or for the video we made for this episode on YouTube. 
If you'd like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our episodes, check out our website at survivorsguidetohell.com, where you'll also find much more information, including links to many of the sources we used for today's podcast. You know the drill. We're always looking for cool news stories. If you've recently stumbled on something that has fascinated you in a positive way, chances are it'll do the same for others. Whether it's a brief fact or a full-fledged story, send us your silver lining ideas via survivorsguidetohell at gmail.com. And remember, if you liked this episode, please subscribe. Gone will be the days that you have to go searching for episodes. They'll be delivered right to the place you listen to your podcasts. Just find our podcast on your listening application and click subscribe or follow. If you've already done this, thank you so much. If you like Survivor's Guide to Hell and would like to help us grow, then you're already on the right track. Just listening is the best thing you can do. We've also seen amazing results when our listeners share our episodes with others. If this episode made you think of someone, send it their way. They may be grateful for it. And we will be too. We want you to join our operation. It's all for a good cause, right? Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. Okay, these are word jokes. Get ready. The past, present, and future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> huh? Huh? Okay, we have a bonus joke this week for the first time ever. It's for my fellow English nerds. Question. What's the difference between a cat and a comma? Answer. One has claws at the end of its paws, and the other is a pause at the end of a clause. Ah, that's great. Okay, thank you, and have an excellent day. Bye.